So while school buildings were closed, students and their teachers were having conversations with the likes of U.S. Senator Barrasso, Congresswoman Cheney, Governor Gordon, and best-selling author C.J. Box, to name a few. Today, Wyoming schools are fully open and they have been all year. And we continue these wonderful conversations. So it is with so much pleasure and immense gratitude that I introduce Dana Perino to Wyoming students. Dana is the co-host of one of the most popular shows on cable television, Fox News, The Five. Co she is the co-anchor of America's Newsroom and analyst for Fox News election coverage and specials and the number one New York Times best-selling author of, and the good news is, Lessons and Advice from the Bright Side, and Let Me Tell You About Jasper. Perino is a former White House press secretary for George W. Bush, where she was the first Republican woman to hold this job. She served for, four, she served for over seven years in the administration, including in the Department of Justice after the terrorist attacks on 9-11. Perino lives in Manhattan with her husband, Peter McMahon, and Jasper, who is also fondly known as America's dog. Dana, you put a smile on millions of faces every day with your optimism, your intelligence, and your charisma. You also don't shy away from asking the tough questions of your guests. So as today's moderator, I'll take privilege of asking the first question. What is it like to be in the hot seat and be interviewed instead of interviewing? <laughs> well, thank you so much for letting me. Okay, wait. I, ah. yay. <laughs> Good thing I wasn't picking my nose or something like that. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so it's it's great to be with you. I'm actually a little jealous because I, I, is it really warm there? How is everybody just in short sleeves? Um, but I remember from Wyoming uh, Springs is it's pretty cold. Uh, so hopefully you have a little bit of a warm snap. Um, so greetings from my Manhattan office. I am here in Midtown. Uh, it's kind of a different scene when it comes to COVID here. Um, but we're all getting through it and people are getting vaccinated. I've had one vaccine. I'm waiting for my second one in a couple of weeks. Um, so anyway, thank you for letting me uh, talk with all of you. Um, I'm excited to be here. So yeah, it's interesting. I initially wanted to do what I'm doing now when I was in high school and college. This is being a news anchor is what I wanted to do, but I took this really roundabout uh, route to get here. And for a long time, I was very much more comfortable answering questions. Um, and part of that was because I was the spokesperson for someone else. So my job wasn't to tell you my opinion about anything. My job was to explain to you President Bush's uh, opinion, how he got to that decision, um, you know, what was coming next. I, you know, I spoke on behalf of the president and the United States of America, and I was very confident uh, in that. When I then switched and became uh, an analyst here, and I was the one being asked the questions. It frankly took me a little while to get comfortable um, expressing my own opinion because that's a little different. It was a little scarier. I remember at one point I was asked about the legalization of drugs and I started to answer based on what the policy position of the Bush administration was. And my colleague, Greg Gutfeld said, no, not what, not what the Bush administration thought. What do you think? And I had to take a step back and I had never articulated my own opinion about anything. And I was kind of hesitant to, because at that time I didn't know if TV was gonna be a longer term career for me. We were in a temporary situation with the, the five wasn't necessarily gonna be a go right away. And then one day I realized like, I don't ever wanna go back to doing public relations. I just wanna be myself. And so once I realized that I could take the full step rather than just a baby step. Then I got more comfortable and now I'm very comfortable asking questions as well because then you don't have to know anything. Actually, what I always try to do is kind of know what they're gonna say. Try to, I don't wanna lead the witness, but I try to get the witness to make some news or make a point and to get out of their regular talking points. That's what I really like to do. Well, thank you so much. Um, 
You know, we are so excited today because we put a call out to Wyoming schools and we have three classes, government and civics classes that are joining us. Um, we've select these classes and they've worked hard to develop questions to ask you. Okay. Because of our technical difficulties this morning, I'm gonna switch things up just a little bit and ask each, each class to ask one question and we'll do that round robin. But quickly, I want to introduce these folks to you. First, we have students in Mrs. Olson's government class, and Angeline and Hannah are the only government students today who aren't at state FFA competition. Oh, okay. <laughs> so both of these uh, ladies enjoy participating in civics firsthand. In fact, I hosted them in my Capitol office just a few weeks ago. Second, we have Mr. Weaver's U.S. government class from Tensley, Lindsay, Peyton, and Kevin. And Mr. Weaver, by the way, was the 2020 Teacher of the Year from Wyoming. Wow, great. Finally, from Fort Washakie High School on the Wind River Reservation, the traditional homeland of the Eastern Shoshone people, we have um, Mrs. LaJambre's students representing several social studies classes and they have a focus on contemporary Native American issues. This is a CWC concurrent class, so they're getting college credit for this as well. Oh, great, With us great. Today are Leilani, Laramie, Kaya, and Kyler. The first question will be led by students from Mr. Weaver's class. Again, we are switching this up just a little bit. So Mr. Weaver's class, if you'll ask one question and then we'll do a round robin and hopefully come back to you. I'll, I'll answer quickly. Hi, Ms. Perino. I'm, Hi. Megan. I'm a senior here at Tensleep and I am going into international relations this year for, at Denver University. So to follow up with that, as being somebody who also was a part of politics and government, what are some of the important ways the media and politics have changed during your career? And do you think these changes have been good or bad? Well, I don't want to be wishy-washy, but I think they've both been good and bad. So when I was a little girl growing up in Wyoming and Colorado, um, I, my dad and I, and well, my mom too, we were voracious news consumers. When I was in third grade, my dad had me read the Rocky Mountain News and the Denver Post before he got home from work. And I had to be prepared to discuss two articles I had chosen before he got home. And I would watch all the nightly news. I loved local news. And then I wouldn't even go outside to play on Sunday night until my dad would assure me that the alarm was set so that I wouldn't miss 60 minutes. Um, <laughs> So I loved the news and it was great. So, but when I was a kid, all of the top anchors uh, were men and they had had those jobs for about 20 years. Their names were Tom Brokaw from South Dakota, actually, Dan Rather and Peter Jennings. And there wasn't any cable news. There was no social media. There was really only the, those three news programs and PBS. And that was the McNeil Lair News Hour, actually now run by Judy Woodruff. Um, Fast forward, now I'm at the White House. Cable news is off and running. So you had uh, CBS, uh, sorry, sorry, CNN, Fox News, and MSNBC. And then during my tenure as press secretary from 05 to 09, um, in more of these blogs started coming on the scene. I was like, what are these things? Okay, this is this real news. Well, it turns out, yeah, real news. Um, journalism is not just something that you can do at CBS. Um, journalism is something that you can do. Uh, from your classroom, as a matter of fact. But one thing that was very different is that from in 2009, when I left the White House, I didn't even have a Twitter account. We didn't have social media, we didn't use it. So if you think about how quickly in terms of, you're young, but if you, you'll realize when you study history, when you get a little bit older, to go from no social media to a media that's almost controlled by social media within four or five years, that's remarkable. And I don't necessarily think that that is a good thing, partly because I think some media outlets try to be fast rather than being accurate. So you want sometimes like you want to break news, you want to be first to break the story. That, that's prestigious. But if you get it wrong, that's horrendous. So one of the things that the current media environment does, it does increase peer pressure because amongst journalists, if you get it wrong, it's so mortifying, it's so embarrassing, like you would like almost never recover. I would die if I got a Pinocchio, like that would be the worst thing for me. So that's why it makes me extra careful. But that doesn't mean everybody's extra careful. So I think that, you know, it's on the one hand, on the other hand, it's, it's some good and some bad. Okay, thank you. 
Yeah. Thank you. And we will move to Mrs. Olson's class next for the next question. And again, um, ladies, if you'll choose one of the questions to ask, we'll try to get back around to you. Hi, I'm Hannah. And my question is, how do you stay informed with uh, accurate information? This is a great question. And I want to tell all of you that if you are living in a democracy, it is your responsibility to stay informed. Right, because in many countries, like in China, the, the state, the government runs the newspaper. And so you don't have a choice. They don't even allow you to look at Facebook in China. So here in America, you have this plethora of information. So then how do you know what is accurate? Well, I always think that you have to find the brands that you trust. For me personally, um, anything I see from the Associated Press the Wall Street Journal and my, my colleagues here at Fox News, like, I feel like I can go straight to air with that. Um, for the most part, I believe that the main media outlets, the New York Times, Washington Post, you may disagree with how they approach something, but the accuracy is usually pretty good. Um, there are exceptions to that rule, but I think that that's one of the things I would look at. The other thing that I've done is I've increased my media diet to include more podcasts. This is also a new medium and it's a wonderful way to stay informed. For example, I love to listen to the NPR um, newscast. There's one called N NPR News First, I think. Hold on, please. I will tell you exactly what it is. It is, of course, it's not showing up for me because I listened to it this morning. Um, I just wanna tell you this because it's a good way to get a quick update, like when you're on your way to school. Okay, NPR News Now. It's a five minute uh, newscast. It updates every hour on the hour. Um, that's a great way for me to just stay a little bit refreshed. Like if I've been in a meeting, like for example, because I'm doing this for an hour, I will listen to that at three o'clock just so I can catch up and just make sure, okay, what have I missed? What do I need to catch up on? Um, and then I also think that there are columnists that I trust. So anything I get at National Review for me, that's a very trusted news source. And then also try to get very local. Local news is such an important part of democracy. And it's important that one, we pay for it. You should subscribe to your local newspaper. It's not very expensive and be a part of it. Also the Pew Foundation found that and, um, cities that have, or towns that have a newspaper or two are usually the least polarized in America. So that's another good reason to support local news. Okay, thank you. You bet. Okay, we're moving to Fort Washakie High School for the third question. Hi, my name is Leilani and the question I have is our school has done a lot of work on the issues of missing and murdered indigenous women and people, including creating a document and our documentary and sharing it with other students and groups in Wyoming. Can you talk mm -hmm. about your involvement with women's issue and mercy ships in your book? In your opinion, what are some major issues faced by women in the world today? And what are types, what types of programs major or jobs would best prepare us to lead in our own communities? Mm -hmm. I, gosh, I would have had an hour to answer the question. But first of all, I think that the fact that you're already working on ways to communicate and to share information with others in a very, I would imagine it as a compelling documentary. Uh, I remember the movie Wind River that came out a few years ago that I saw. Um, I do think that popular culture shining a bright light on these issues is very helpful. Um, so that, that's one thing in your favor. A documentary, I think is great. Look, when I was growing up, like, we didn't have YouTube, but the fact that you could actually produce something that can get some attention, that is just incredible. That is very, very powerful. Um, what could you study? Look, I, I have a, a good friend named, he's passed away. His name is Charles Krauthammer. Uh, he always advised young people to study history, no matter what. He said, because to know your history, one, it makes you a better thinker. Also history repeats itself, so there's that. And also it will make you a better writer. In the book that I just wrote, I talk about how important it is to be a good writer when you're entering the workforce. 
too many people come out of school and they're still needing to learn how to write. And I find that employers at the, at the entry level, they're actually doing things that should have been taught in, in a late high school or college. Um, so you need to take it upon yourselves to become better writers. If you're a better writer, you're a better communicator. If you're communicating better, then you are more persuasive and getting attention to the issues that you talked about. Um, you asked what my, I think the last part of your question was, what are the big issues surrounding them? You know, it sort of depends on the region in which you are living. So in Africa, for example, maternal health is a really, really big issue. Um, there is no health care for women in or, or, uh, childhood early development. In some of the countries you might have, let's say you have 50 million people that are there, they might have 100 doctors total. And there's just not enough. So, so that's something. Um, one thing they found though, is that um, at Mercy Ships, which is a surgical hospital ship that services the West Coast of Africa, they have a nursing training program. It's very interesting to learn that what they found over the years is that if they taught a male doctor something and how to do something, a procedure, something about preventative medicine, he will then help take care of the people, but he won't tell anybody else how to do it because he doesn't want to share information. Why? Information is power. What they found, however, is if they told a woman, they told a nurse, the nurse would tell all her friends exactly how to do it so that then the knowledge could spread. So when you're thinking about what can you do, sharing your information, I mean, women do it very well. We love, we love to talk. Um, but sharing information, not hoarding it, is a really great way to make sure that the issues you care about are the ones that others will care about too. That's a wonderful response, thank you. And we do hopefully have time to go around again. Um, so we'll move back to Mr. Weaver's class uh, for the next question. Hi, um, my name is Lindsay Holiday and I'm also a senior here at Tensley. So especially in the past year, I feel like um, the career field of politics has been one of the most divided and controversial. So my question for you is what motivated you to go into politics and how do you stay so optimistic while working with it every single day? <laughs> um, well, one, oh gosh, that's such a great question. Um, yeah, so we're divided, but what happened in 1864? right? The Civil War, I mean, that's divided. Um, President Bush used to tell me what happened in 1968. That was the year that he came out of college. And Americans were literally fighting each other in the streets at that time. The civil unrest was very bad. So we're not there yet. Um, we are divided. And I think this, when people ask me, like, what can we do about this? Or what can we do to solve polarization in, in the country? I'm like, that's like just too big a problem for me to chew on myself. So this is how I think about it. What can I do every day? What can I do in my own life to make sure that I'm not a part of the polarization problem? Am I the best role model I could be for my family in the apartment building in which I live? It's just such a different way to grow. I mean, it is just bizarre. You guys have the sky rises here and you live up 42nd floor and you, you don't even know your neighbors. It's the weirdest thing in the world. But I think like, you know, I know the guys that work in my building, am I good to them? And do I set a good example here at the office? When I'm on air and people are watching me, do they wanna be more like me? Or do they cringe? Do they think I'm too divisive? Like I would never want that. So I think that there's just so much more to do with personal responsibility. And then when you realize that you don't have to own the comments of anybody else, like, I don't, anybody else here that works at Fox, I don't own what they say. I only own what I say. So can I be the best possible person every day for myself and be confident that when I look in the mirror at night, brushing my teeth, do I like what I see? And there's been times in my life, like when I worked at the White House, there were times when I would be snarky or um, you know, sarcastic to a reporter. And as soon as it came out of my mouth, I regretted it. You know, so swallowing sarcasm and listening a lot more than talking, that will get you far in your career. Believe me, like being on, if you're not on social media, it's not going to hurt your career. It, it's not. I, we just hired a guy 
I was like, why is this guy? Does he have an Instagram? Does he have Facebook? Does he have Snapchat? The guy's never been in social media. He's 28 years old. I'm like, wow, what restraint. And I asked him like, why? And he said, I just didn't think it would serve me well. And I thought, you know, look, I'm not saying don't be on social media. I'm just saying that you are responsible for yourself. And then how you're conducting yourself will help have ripple effects across your school, your community. If you're deciding to go to college, you know, take that kind of attitude with you there. And I stay optimistic because truly to be have born in America is the greatest gift. And I, I want to say everybody, something to everybody here. And I write about this in, in my book that for a long time, when I, even when I was at the White House sitting with the president at the table with everyone else, I had such an education inferiority complex because I didn't go to Stanford or Yale or Harvard. And a lot of my colleagues did. I went to the University of Southern Colorado on a speech team scholarship. I went to public school, I didn't go to private, I didn't go to boarding school or anything like that. And I just thought, I just assumed that everybody was much more educated than me. And after a while, I noticed I'm like, oh, the president turns to me for advice just as much as he turns to anybody else. And so you don't have to grow up on the East Coast or California to be really successful. And it's one of the reasons I agreed to do this event today. I, I, I feel just so strongly about you recognizing that you won life's great lottery. You were born in America. And there are challenges and our country is far from perfect, but we are based on an idea that all men are created equal. And so if you focus on that and you recognize, especially for you young people, this pandemic has not been easy. And for, especially for those graduating college in, in, in 2020, imagine their whole lives are turned upside down. But we're gonna need your ingenuity and your excitement and your optimism because that's what makes a big difference for the success of not only yourself and your life, but for the country and the world. I still believe that America leads the world and I wanna lead the world um, because we are the best. <laughs> Thank you so much. That was, a, that was an amazing answer. So thank you. You bet. Thank you, Dana. That, that is a, an amazing and inspirational response. Um, I think we have time to continue on to uh, Mrs. Olson's class for another question and then go through to Fort Washakie and have them ask their final question, then we'll wrap up. Okay. Okay, so our nation is founded on specific or specific values. Um, what values do you think are most important and what can we do to preserve them? Well, I definitely think that the, um, the Declaration of Independence is one of the most beautiful documents um, that you could read and maybe even commit it to memory. And it's something that you could recite uh, when you're out there riding your bike or your horse, what, whatever you might do, taking a walk, going for a run. Um, we hold these truths to be self-evident, right? Think, think about how, how brilliant our founding fathers were. And again, not perfect people, but their ideas were headed in the right direction. And then it's our responsibility to carry that out. Um, I also think that the first amendment is first for a reason. What is that? That's the freedom of speech, the freedom of assembly and the freedom of religion and the freedom of the press. And why did they want that? Well. Think about what they were coming from, where something you said could land you in jail, cost you your living, ruin your family, where the ruling class was never having to answer any questions from the people over which they ruled, where people who wanted to practice their religion were persecuted, put in jail, killed. And so I think about the press and I'll just mention this, you know, when I was press secretary, I used to think that um, not only was it important to defend the president and the presidency itself, but also to defend the right of the press to ask questions of the president. Because democracy is a participatory sport and it's a two way street. So protecting the rights of the press is very important. <laughs> Thank you. And moving on to Fort Washakie.
And Fort Washakie, you are on mute. There we go. Hi, my name is Tyler. Um, I guess the question I want to ask you is, in your book, you talked about your unique roots in Wyoming and Colorado and being in competition for your first jobs with people from Ivy League schools. Yeah. We believe the foundation in rural Wyoming and traditional culture on the reservation will be valuable in a variety of careers we plan to pursue. Making our experiences and, and values unique, what kinds of things do you think companies notice about those differences? How do you deal with being intimidated or judged by people from a typical background on the national stage? Thank you for the question. And I think that, um, again, this goes to that point that I had where I definitely had what I would call an educational inferiority complex. But when I went to college, I was on the speech team. I think I mentioned that. And my freshman year, we went to Washington State and we were competing uh, against lots of different schools from the Western part of the country. And it was like a national tournament. And I couldn't believe it. I made it to the finals. And I, I had already changed into my sweats for the ride home when they said, Dana, what are you doing? You're in the finals. And I was so nervous. And my speech coach said, it's okay to be, it's okay to have butterflies in your stomach as long as you make them fly in formation. And I found that, you know, I had to do that quite a bit. Um, to be honest, I do believe that I did not have as rigorous a reading curriculum as my contemporaries. Um, that went to like maybe a boarding school or um, a private school. I, I had to make up for a little bit of lost time uh, on the reading front on all sorts of things. Not the classics, because I love to read. I love my literature courses, but some of the bigger and more important documents in history, I missed a lot of that, um, or at least I didn't do enough of what I needed to do. Um, so that would have actually kept me at par with the others, but I had to catch up and I finally got there. One of the things I look for as a employee, uh, employer or a manager is I want diversity of experience, not just diversity of people, which I want as well, but I want diversity of experience and diversity of thought. To me, a team is really better off if you have people from all different types of backgrounds or experiences. Um, I also think that any sort of service project that you have done is a great conversation starter. So, um, like for example, the documentary, the documentary that was mentioned, uh, this is this group, you know, that's something that an employer might say, oh, tell me more about that. Because when you go to enter the workforce, you're gonna be in a pretty competitive situation. Uh, you're gonna be well set up because you're getting a good education. I can tell that you have a good camaraderie and Wyoming is a special place. Like you can, you, you will be warmly supported by the people there and by all of your friends and, and your colleagues for the rest of your life. But that, that's a two-way street as well. You have to help everyone. But think of something that would set you apart that if I got a hundred resumes and I need to make a cut down to 10 or to five, what is it about you that would be a little bit different? It might just be one line at the end of your um, resume. Like this kid that didn't have any social media, he's in a band, what do you play? Oh, interesting, right? And so find a different way to not just be so focused on the academics that you're missing a little bit more about life and the fun. And also that doesn't mean you have to go do something that is like, um, you know, so virtuous. Like I'm not saying that you have to go and do like some big mission project, though that's fabulous as well, but do something unique, do something fun. Like what are your interests? What's your passion? Tell me more about that because that will also set you apart the way I like to look at employees is that you're not just a person that's just going to, you know, pound holes for me or, you know, and, and, and staple my documents together and walk out the door. Like you're a whole person. And one day you'll also be a manager and this will make a lot more sense. Like you're going to be looking for what is that, what is that little spark? What's that little difference that you can bring to the table? And I think that your diversity is a fabulous thing. Um, and for a lot of people, I don't wanna say diversity just for diversity's sake. I'm saying that diversity comes in a lot of different ways. If you are a young white man um, and you're listening to this, think, well, gosh, everybody wants diversity and that's not me. That's not someone I'm talking about. I mean, diversity in terms of your ideas or your accomplishments, your passions, your interests, your drive, D diversity of thought, diversity of experience. 
And here's the other thing I'm gonna recommend to all of you. If you haven't done it already, when the pandemic is over, you have to come to Washington DC for a educational vacation, you have to. Just so you can get, I don't care if you don't wanna work in DC or politics or history, I don't care about that. You need to come and better understand it. You've, you've, now you've studied lots of things. You've studied your history courses, you studied political science or social science. Now come and see where it's done, just so that you have a sense of that. And then the other thing I really want you to do, I want you to take as many road trips across this country as you can. See what you can. Maybe ask your mom and dad, can we go for, uh, can we go this summer? Can we, can we drive to New Mexico and see the Chaco Canyon, um, the ruins there? So just get out and see it because that will one, open your mind, but also it gives you so much to talk about in all of the upcoming networking events that you're going to do. Maybe that's a little bit different. Maybe a, maybe a person that's gonna interview you actually grew up in New Mexico. Oh, I've been there actually. Oh, really? What did you see? Oh, people love to talk about where they're from. If people ask you about the Wind River, you love to tell them about it. And so I just want you to try to like, just think about this. You are not inferior to anybody else in America for having grown up in a rural environment. You are actually so much better off for having done that because now you have this diversity of experience that they don't have. I have this fantasy of taking my, my colleagues here and like dropping them off in the middle of Newcastle, Wyoming and watching to see like with a remote camera to see if they could survive. It would just be hilarious to me. But you know what? They felt the same way about me. When I first got here, first of all, when I moved to Washington DC, I parked my car and I did not move it for five weeks. I was terrified to drive in the city. And they would think that was crazy. When I first moved to New York, I would walk 40 blocks rather than learn how to ride the subway because I didn't, I didn't, I was scared. What was I scared of? One day I spent $50, I was going to jury duty. I spent $50 on a taxi and I was late to go to jury duty. And when, as I'm walking into the courthouse, I look behind me and there was a subway entrance. And so I called my husband and said, today's the day. I have to learn how to ride the subway. It took two minutes. It's the easiest thing. And now I can get anywhere within five minutes in the city. So you see like this diversity of experience, it actually can be very beneficial. Just open yourself up to lots of experiences and just be really proud of where you come from. That's, that's wonderful. And um, Dana, your book is full of so many bits of advice and you've added on to those today. And I can't imagine that there is one viewer, young or old today, mm -hmm who isn't able to be inspired and take something away from your words of wisdom and we so right. appreciate it. But there's one thing that we've left on the table that I think we just uh, need to give a little attention to and that's Jasper. Yeah. <laughs> Would you, uh, you know, you have such a wonderful social media presence and especially with respect to Jasper, but he really seems to inspire you and he inspires yeah. so many across America. And yeah, I want a fan made this. I wonder if you could just quickly introduce us to Jasper uh, I wish in real life. That's okay. But tell us, uh, tell us a little bit about him and um, why he's so special. And then um, we just love to hear your parting thoughts and, um, and then I'll, I'll thank you at the end again. Great. So yeah, Jasper is, uh, he'll be nine on Friday. Um, he's my second dog that I've had with my husband. We've been married 24 years. Um, this is Jasper here. Um, I brought Jasper as a puppy onto the set nine years ago. And ever since then, my fans send me stuff about him all the time. Um, he's got he's got such personality. I grew up with dogs, like I'm sure many of you have grown up with dogs. And um, Jasper is the funniest dog with like the most personality and the best behaved dog. He's good in the countryside, he's good in the city. You can walk through a crowd in, in Times Square with him. He will, he will weave between the people. He'll, he knows how to navigate. He never gets the leash caught between you and the lamp post. Um, but I've also found that um, having a dog is a great way to avoid politics or to bridge divisions because I have a couple of rules. I never talk about politics at the dog park ever. Not even if somebody says, oh, but please, what do you think? Like, no, I don't do it ever. It's a rule that I have. Um, also, most people love their dogs. And if you find that you um, don't have anything else to talk about, like you talk about a family pet, it will almost always give you something to talk about. So I think that's been also very good. And then there's something to be said about um, having a companion that will 
not give a crap that you got to go on Air Force One and fly to Europe to have dinner with the prime minister and the president. Like, he didn't care about that. And my first dog, Henry, that I had as an adult, I had him from when I was 26 to 40. And that includes, so that went from getting married in England to moving to the United States, living in San Diego, the 9-11 attacks, moving to Washington, DC, becoming the White House press secretary, moving to New York and having a chance to be an anchor on television. And he saw my whole, that all of that transition. And so when he passed away, that was, it was so hard, but that's when we ended up with Jasper, who was hilarious and, and a really great dog. So um, that, thanks for asking about him. He's fine. He's, he's gonna be nine on, uh, on Friday. Um, Parting thoughts. Um, I, it, I think that one of the best compliments I get is from people who've known me for a long time, like my, maybe my whole life, or even if they, they, they knew me in um, college or in my first jobs to today, the best compliment I get is that they'll say, I'm the same person I am today that I was then. Mm -hmm. And I put that down to, you know, the way I was raised. Um, I'm not better than anybody else. I've had great career opportunities and I've worked very hard uh, to get there. And when I say that everything will be okay in my book title, I believe that that's true. But that comes with a tremendous amount of personal responsibility, good decision-making and discipline. And really focus in the next 10 years on investing in your future whether you go to college or uh, decide to go to a trade school, maybe you're gonna start your own business or stay with the family business for the next 10 years, really apply yourself. And that will set you up for more career success so that you can you know, enjoy adulthood a little bit more. I worried my twenties away and I really, really beg you not to do the same. Well, thank you so much. Um, we're so grateful that you chose to spend some of your time with Wyoming students today. And um, I wanna thank the students and the teachers that are on this um, discussion, uh, either either viewing or participating. They did such a hard, or such a, a, a great job of preparing for today. And they, they really did a fantastic, uh, fantastic work preparing. So uh, I wanna let everyone know that this will be available on demand shortly. And again, Dana, I just, thank you so much for agreeing to this event and for spending a little time with us virtually in Wyoming. Um, thank you for all of the work that you do and for the inspiration that you share with millions. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, and good luck. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.